Today's guest is Maura Sweeney, the ambassador of happiness. We're going to explore how to live a happy life. Imagine it's 12 months from now and you've achieved your major life goals. How does it feel to be in the best shape of your life, to wake up energized, excited about the day, to have great relationships and friends who support you and propel you forward? How does it feel to have an excess of money, to be able to make the choices you want, to be fearless and open to trying new adventures? Imagine being connected to the universe and it providing everything you desire. It's possible over time, and your past does not dictate your future. The only thing holding you back from this vision is you. It's time to take control of our thoughts and use them to our advantage. Welcome to Richer Soul, where we achieve our dreams and bring balance to health, wealth, relationships, time, and spirituality. If you have not had a chance to listen to episodes one through nine, I encourage you to go back and listen to the framework behind Richer Soul and how to create the life of your dreams. You can also find all the show notes for this episode at richersoul.com. While you're there, you can sign up for a monthly email where I share the best articles I read this month, let you know about upcoming episodes, and share a little wisdom. You can also listen to coaching calls under the coaching calls tab. I also share the most interesting articles I read every week on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash richer soul. And there's also a Facebook group where you can ask questions, inter interact with other listeners. This is the third in a series of shows on happiness and how we have the controlling choice within ourselves to create a thrilling life of our dreams. Having the stuff is not going to make us happy. That happens inside us. Today's focus is on health. There's both physical health and mental health. And the two are tied closely together. Our thoughts drive both of these, and without good health, everything else seems to fall apart. At the core is what we put into our bodies. What fuel are you filling up with? Are the foods you are eating truly healthy for you? Science keeps changing their minds on what is and what isn't healthy. And the reality is, we all react differently. A peanut is a great snack for one person, and deadly for the next. Are the foods you're eating causing inflammation in your body? There are many tests you can now take to see what you're allergic to. You can also have a microbiome test like I did to see if you have the right bacteria in your gut helping you to properly digest the foods you eat. Science is only now researching how important gut health is and how it's also tied to our mental health. Speaking of mental health, what are you feeding your brain? Living in a time where we're marketed to 24-7, we need to be very careful of what we see and hear and how we react. Are you learning daily, stepping out of your comfort zone, growing? That's what we'll talk about today with our guest. Before I go, though, I'll encourage you to Google gut bacteria and mental health. You'll be surprised at what you find there. I'm also going to work on getting a guest in this area to come on the show so we can dig into it deeper. Today... I'm excited to speak with Maura Sweeney, who is on a mission to uplift and unite the human race from the inside out. Maura left behind careful grooming and family expectations, exiting law school midstream to pioneer her own way to personal happiness, purpose, and authenticity. A former decorated corporate manager and homeschooling mom, Maura set out again at midlife to become a powerful voice in the global marketplace with a paradigm-shifting concept on identity, influence, and personal leadership. She's been featured on NBC, BBC, and European TV. She's keynoted in nine different countries, lectured aspiring FBI and CIA candidates, spoken at the inaugural Nelson Mandela Day celebrations, and joined several celebrities as a spoken word contributor to Action Moves People United, raising awareness for world peace. Her greatest joy comes from helping others see themselves through a brighter lens. 
empowering them to step into their highest and most authentic versions of their self. Let's meet our guest. Welcome to Richer Soul, Maura. It's great to have you join us today. Rocky, I am so happy to be here and to chat with you. And I'm excited about the conversation. I think we're going to learn a lot and share that with the audience. So we always like to start at the beginning. What was it like when you were growing up and how much did your family and school teach you about money? Okay, growing up many years ago, I'm 60, just so your listeners know, I grew up in northern New Jersey, right outside of New York City. I grew up in a middle class town, but I was from a family that was more educated and more affluent than most. A situation, I would say, that put me in a very awkward spot. I never felt in life like I fit in. But I will share some interesting pieces with you. And now they may be dotted, not necessarily strung together in time. But I will say this. I noticed growing up good things that I continued with for the rest of my life. And I would call those things that have to deal with relationships, family, being true to oneself. I love that. I live for that, Rocky, which is one reason why I was so happy to talk with you. I love relationship. Some of the flip side of that was growing up and literally being groomed to be a person that I never was, but the grooming had everything to do with being in the right place, with the right people, with wearing the right clothes, with going to the right schools, being with the right people that translated oftentimes seemed to be something that was quote unquote better than others. I'll even tell you this. My grandfather passed away and he was an attorney. We moved into his home, which was a five bedroom brick home. And it was already the biggest home in town. But picture a middle class town during the 1960s. We had the first built in pool. My father had a huge Lincoln Continental car, black. It was the kind that the presidents used to drive. In fact, I remember telling him, please, when you bring me somewhere, drop me off a block in advance because I don't want anybody to see me. The doors would open up differently on the back as a limousine would open up. And thirdly, we had a live-in domestic, a wonderful, beautiful woman from the islands who lived with us as our in-home maid. All of those things, Rocky, made me feel uncomfortable because I felt if we were those kinds of people, we should have been living in a town where other people were like that, not putting me in that kind of a place. But I want to share one deeper thing than that. My friends that I grew up with probably saw me as a highly privileged girl. I was going to a private school at one point. What they didn't realize is that much of our lives were front lives. And I think people live that way where it's all about the appearances. It's all about spending money maybe and not thinking about tomorrow, doing things for the purposes of what they look like rather than for what they really mean to us as individuals. My mother reminded me of something years later. She said, Maura, do you remember you would always say growing up, when I grow up, I'm going to live in a small house. And she probably didn't know why I said that. But as soon as she mentioned it, I remembered. It was because so much was put into the house that I lived in as a child that there was no other money to go out, to do things, to extend. I remember my mother always saying, oh, we can't leave the house. Maybe somebody will come and rob it. And I would think, what kind of a life is this if your life is underneath the house you live in rather than you being the individual who uses the house for your purposes. Does that make sense? It was almost as if, if I could encapsulate everything I just talked to you about, Rocky, I grew up feeling like I lived an inverted life, not a true life, but a life that was designed the wrong way. And I remember having various thoughts during my lifetime, all of which were good in the end, that I wanted to live an authentic life and I wanted that the things I owned didn't own me. I wanted to be the owner and the navigator of my life and I wanted to feel free, not constrained or constricted based on debt and based on things that I felt other people needed to see in order to esteem me or view me in a certain way. How's that for an intro? (laughs) That's a wonderful intro and there's a couple things I find very interesting. It sounds like you lived the Facebook Instagram life before Facebook and Instagram. And it wasn't my choosing. It wasn't my choosing. No, it wasn't your choosing. Was was, yeah, I yeah, get it. But you're right about that. It's too superficial and I am not a superficial person. I'm a relationship person. I go from heart to heart, not from thing to thing. And in addition to that, it seems like you were trying to live the American dream. And I get it. I think a lot of people are still trying to do that. And you found out at a very early age that that dream just wasn't all that. 
And so you built a different life because of that. Although you had some detours before you got there, I believe. But it's quite interesting to see how here we are a considerable time later, and yet the attitudes are still the same from that generation to this generation and the way people live. Interesting you should say that. And as soon as you brought it to the Facebook and Instagram generation, I guess I don't view myself as that kind of a personality, but I've heard other people say that it's the front life, right? I used to call it, it was the window curtains. It's the same idea. It all looks beautiful and wonderful. And me, I'd rather just be happy and free. And that's the way to be. And I think that's kind of the awakening that a lot of people need to have. And that's what we talk about on the show. And I didn't mean to say that you live that life. I meant that's the life yeah. that was kind of thrust upon you. Correct. But it all worked out well because feeling all of those discomforts, I remember thinking I'm a child and I'm growing up under someone else's roof, but I will have my own generation, in which case I will make my own decisions along the way. It doesn't always mean they're easy or that they don't cost us at some level. But I know that the person that I am today feels far more harmonious and free and happy, let's say, than I did growing up feeling like I was living the Facebook or Instagram type life. Absolutely. So you have a daughter. Did you do something different to raise her and teach her about money? I did. Now, this was many years later. I was supposed to be a lawyer. That was another piece of why I felt like it was an inverted life. So I went halfway through law school. I was taking out loans all to please my family that decided this is what I was going to be. Then I had to pay the law school loans back. But I ended up with a corporate career, loved it very much. And then when I was 34, we had our one and only child, at which point I had worked myself out of a lot of the superfluous debt. I paid off my car. All my student loans were done. I just tried to live as much within my means. Fortunately, I was able to stay home for several years and work only part-time with my husband, raised my daughter, and homeschooled her, the thing I thought I'd never do because I was more the career person. Rocky, I learned so much during that time period about how to set up a home, how to be a mom, how to bond with my daughter, how to teach her how to be a critical thinker and how to give her a love for learning, a natural love for learning. And here, if I could talk further a little bit about money, and I think this is probably really good as a point here. When I left my corporate job, I was in management. And at that time, I probably could have comfortably cared for a family of four on my own. So just to give you an idea of the income, didn't mean I was super rich by any means, but I left it behind. Now, here's the crazy thing. I one day calculated Had I sent our daughter to private schools, which we thought we'd originally do, and I calculated all the money I would have spent on people watching her when I was working, sending her to private schools, I thought about all the trips my family and I took to Europe with money maybe that could have been for the schools. And then I also had our daughter, and it was really her idea, to be an early college enrolled student here in Florida. All we did was pay for the books. So when I taught her, it was maybe $500 a year to be a homeschool parent. And when she went to college, all we had to do was pay for her books for the first two years, after which point she ended up getting an AA degree and then going up to Boston for university. But the interesting point I wanted to make about this, one day I did the math. By my staying home, homeschooling our daughter, it's not for everybody. And it wouldn't have been for me if I had more than one child. I calculated how much money it would have cost me to have to earn every year in order to put her in private school, send her for those first two years of college, pay for all those child care. And it was like, wow, I saved so much money by being the parent that taught. So we don't always have to see things through the standard lens that everybody says, this is the way you need to do it. Our daughter flourished. I wouldn't have wanted to be homeschooled. She loved it and she did very well. So There's a little bit of a thing there. But going beyond that, I remember raising our daughter and my husband's very much the same to follow those things that were important to her. So really to be somewhat value driven, it didn't mean she wouldn't be aware of her surroundings. We taught her how to manage her money, not spend money she didn't have. So there were a lot of things along the way. I told you I'm 60 years old. I have a lot of life lessons. (laughs) You mentioned something very interesting. You said your goal was to teach her to be a critical thinker. Yes. And love to learn. Yes. Where did that come from? Me. (laughs) Where did it come from from you? Like, how did you know to do that? There were many things I had to do in school to get through school. And I was always a good student. I'd be always taking copious notes. I was always studying. I believe, Rocky, that I learned far more 
after I got out of college and after I left law school, I have a year and a half of law school, and I even thought about going back. And then I thought, there's no one degree that man gives out there that I'm interested in. I love learning about things I'm interested in on my own. And I want, I'm a lifelong learner, and I feel so much wiser and more worldly wise than I ever did going through school. And this is not to take anything away from school per se. It was just to say that to be a critical thinker and to learn how to learn and how to teach oneself, how to look at a variety of perspectives, where to find information, and then how to critically assess everybody else's opinions and orientations, and then find ways to formulate your own position on something and know why you feel the way you do. I don't think we do that in school these days. I think it's a lot of, you're going to get somebody's opinion and you're going to regurgitate it. And I think that that undoes a lot of our integrity, our own ability to assess information. And I think that has a lot to do with our own emotional intelligence. We need to learn how to grow and develop it so that we can become our own person, not a carbon copy of maybe someone who came before us, who may or may not be speaking for our value system or our belief system. And I agree with you 100%. My kids were classically educated. And classical education is kind of how we used to educate kids before about the last hundred something years with modern schooling. Some of the core tenets of classical education are critical thinking and learning how to learn. And so when you said those words, it was just interesting because that is exactly what they are taught. It's not teaching you what to think, but how to think. Exactly. And because of that, they both essentially dropped out of high school and just created their own learning program for the last couple of years. That's what my daughter did. My son's kind of following the path of your daughter. He started college at 16 and is going to a local community college. So very similar path. I think when you have kids who can go learn on their own and do their own things, then they're not stuck in societal norms of what you're supposed to learn and when you're supposed to learn it. And it's just interesting that these themes keep coming up more and more. It's just a shame more and more people aren't aware that you do not have to follow the traditional schooling and the traditional path as well. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Rocky, because what I look at today, I'm sure you're aware of this because you're a money coach. When I was small, uh, let's go back to the 60s and maybe early 70s. They used to refer to these things as blue collar jobs. Let's say someone is a plumber or they were uh, an electrician. Now, these were supposedly blue collar jobs, the people that didn't go to college. And yet people were supposed to go to college back then because they would get the white collar, more higher paying jobs. Today, there are so many young people I know from universities I speak at and places I travel where they have a master's degree and they can't find a job or they are making coffee as a barista somewhere and they have huge student loans, but they were literally sold on the whole idea that you need to go out there and get an education. In some cases, they are dealing with student loans at the rate of, what, 6% per year. It's like buying a big house, and you have no way of, of supporting yourself and paying off those loans, let alone buying your own house or building a life on top of it. So when I look today, I see there are people that are entrepreneurs that have a skill that have created their own line of work and end up being self-sufficient and being able to support themselves apart from, let's say, the corporate structures or the structures that we were taught growing up that we needed to fill ourselves into and find our identity and our livelihood in. And if people have been out there long enough, they know corporations are not your daddy. (laughs) They're not necessarily going to take care of you. No, they're not. They're going to use you so they can make money. And when they're done, they're done. And that has dramatically changed since the 60s when you were guaranteed a pension and a job for life. And that is no longer the case. Absolutely. And so the landscape has changed, but the rules haven't yet in terms of the popular culture or the common culture. People still follow old rules in a world that no longer exists as it did several decades ago. You're preaching to the choir. (laughs) So as a money coach, one of the things we always like to do is look at people's relationships and their money mindsets. And one of the ways that we do that is to ask a simple question, which is money is fill in the blank. And I hear you have a very interesting answer to this question. So I'm waiting to hear what money is to you. Okay. How about if I tell you money gives one options? 
That's it. That's how I see money. It gives us options. And I, I could go back to a story. I mentioned that I had a corporate career before what I do today. I was in management. And when I was brought to this new company, they brought the, uh, the corporate um, psychologist in or actually flew me up to meet with him. And it was probably four hours worth of tests that all had to do with my management skills and the way I thought. And I'm sure they were doing all these kinds of uh, assessments on me. When I went back into the office to meet with this psychologist, he said to me, Maura, he said, I've been doing this for 15 years, I believe it was. And he said, all this time, no one ever answered a question as you did. And I said, what question are you referring to? He said, it's a fill in the blank question. And it was money blank. And I said, gives one options. And he said, what were you referring to? What he didn't know is that the company that I had joined I was very clear on what my management style was and how I treat other people. The manager that I ended up with, the one who recruited me in, who knew everything I was about, turned out to be a very unstable personality, very, and wanted me to mistreat my employees, something I just could never do. And I remember Rocky at the time, my husband and I had just bought our newest home with a jumbo mortgage. I don't even know if they offer those anymore. We also had a brand new condo that we were renting out, the two bedroom condo to two people. And we had a family renting out our original first home. Now we were in our late 20s at the time, maybe 30 years old. So picture this, three mortgages. My husband's in sales like I am. He just lost 40% of his income with one of his biggest clients. And I switch companies and I have a manager who, who is not right. And she is challenging me to change my value system and to treat people poorly. And I thought, I can't run because every day I had to go to work and make sure we paid three mortgages and stayed on top of all of this. I remember waking up one night and I want to say I was 30 years old. Rocky, I woke up at night and I was in a cold sweat in my bed, bolt upright. And I thought, oh my gosh, can I do this? Can I do this? I was so afraid because I didn't have an option. What I wanted to do was tell that manager See ya. And I couldn't do it. From that day and from that era, Rocky, I realized that because I didn't have the excess money or I had not put myself in a position that I could leave an unfortunate situation that was causing my value system to be to be challenged. And I also didn't want to give my energies to someone who was like that. I didn't have an option because I didn't have any money in savings and my overhead was too big. So that was a defining moment in my life. And I want to tell you, at that point, I could remember, I just, I started paying off every little and big thing I could find to the point where my husband and I were maybe 37. We didn't owe anybody anything, including a mortgage, because I never wanted somebody to dictate to me again because of money. So money is options. <laughs> that's what financial freedom is. It's the ability, it, it's not that you're going to sit around and do nothing and not work. And clearly you've worked Since then, it's the ability to say no. It's the ability to have choices, to have options, to do what you want on your terms the way you want to do it. And I think people need to understand that that is the reason you have financial freedom. Not so that you can sit around and drink Mai Tais all day, but it's so that you can choose what you want to do and live life on your terms. You just have to figure out all your puzzle pieces and see how they fit together for you and what you want instead of being dictated by what other people want for you. Exactly. Exactly. And you know what? I'm glad you made that point. There are some people think, oh, I want to retire. I'm not that kind of a person. I love being out there. I love the things I do as a public speaker and a traveler and having my own podcast as you do. I don't want to retire. I just want to know that my life is supportive of the things that I wish to do. And a lot of times people look at the money and think that it's all about the money. And yet at the same time, they sort of lose their own value system or they lose focus on what their real interests are or what those things are that are important to them. And I wanted to invert my life in such a way that I had a home and a living environment that would give me the freedom to do the things I do. And just so I could move you up a little bit more, as our daughter was getting ready for college and my husband and I, who had a very 
profitable computer firm, uh, decided we wanted to do things to positively impact culture. We wanted to travel more. Uh, we wanted to create some of our own things. We sold our home, we exited our business, and we bought a more modest townhome. And again, you know, we, we ended up buying it with cash. But even at that point, Rocky, there were so many excess things we got rid of. And I just, how do I want to say this? It was like we scaled down and simplified our lives. I would call it being a purist. There are a lot of things that we buy, that we hold on to, that we have to maintain, but we can't get out and do sometimes the things we want to do because the things we are holding on to are keeping us from it. So that was even another another piece of the journey is just simplifying our lives so that we would be freer to do those things that were of interest to us. And it didn't involve retiring. It really involved being free to travel and to try new things. So for all of you minimalists out there who think this is a new idea, today you're hearing it isn't anything new. It's been done before. And here you have somebody who's years ahead of the current minimalist crunch. And I will tell you, that's a lesson I learned. It was a few years back. We just got tired of having so much stuff. And I paid people to come in my house and just haul everything out. And it is so freeing and it's so liberating and it's wonderful. And I think we have a couple more rounds to go through still of just getting rid of stuff. I don't know how you, I, I guess the, the best message is, is to go to the people who are just starting out and who are, you know, in their early 20s to say, just don't accumulate all this crap. You can if you want to, but follow the lessons of those before you. Is it really worth it? And do you really want it? And do you want to be chained down? You know, that's very interesting. And I agree with you in all of it. And here's the thing, you know, when you mention the word minimalist, and they also have the tiny house movement right now, and it all sort of feeds into the same thing, where people want to have a life. I came up with yet another word for it. So that people sometimes they hear minimalism, and they think, Oh, I'm going to live like a monk in a room that has nothing in it other than a bed and a lamp. But think about this word, which is a positive word. Think about being a purist. You know what a purist is? Someone who chooses to accumulate, not accumulate, but to possess or to have within their life the things that are meaningful to them. Now, I just mentioned to you, we moved to a more modest townhome. We had to get rid of so many things that didn't fit into this place in many different ways. And I loved being able to get rid of 25 years worth of excess stuff I never wanted to begin with. But I'll tell you another story. During that time that we moved, in our prior home, I think we had a five-bedroom home, whatever, I always had an upright piano, and I love piano, but all my life, I wanted a grand piano. Everywhere I'd go and I'd see a grand or a baby grand piano, I'd go play it. So we move into this smaller place, we get rid of so much stuff, and guess what I did? One day, I sold my upright piano, and I bought a beautiful baby grand piano, and it now sits in this smaller home. So even though we got rid of a lot of things, I actually chose something that was important to my soul. Does that make sense? I got rid of a big dining room table and, and service for 40 people. And what used to be, let's say in the town home we're in right now, what could have been a dining room, not a big one, is now my office. I love it. So that when I say being a purist, it is doing those things that are important to your heart and to your soul without thinking so much about what does everybody else out there think of me? Does this look good to everybody else? But what feels good to me and what feels harmonious with my values and my interests and the lifestyle I'd like to lead? So it's a positive word, but it's saying the very same thing. And I think people need to figure out for themselves because that is the first step. What is important to me? What is it that I want in is it for me or is it because someone or society has put an obligation on me to feel that particular way? And once you have clarity on what you want, then it becomes very easy to go get it. Exactly. And most of us have bifurcated minds. It's like, well, I know on the inside maybe what it was I want, but boy, oh boy, I have all these friends or all these, maybe they're country club friends or they're people in a social group or people you work with and they think a different way. And then what we end up doing, we become carbon copies of other people who may not be in their way or their authentic way either. And we're trying to follow people that walk around with their own question mark rather than saying, you know, who am I and how can I live an authentic life according to what makes me happy? Absolutely. You've kept mentioning one word throughout our conversation, and that is relationships. And it's a key word at Richer Soul because it's, it's, I think it's one of the tenets is that relationships is a major part of life. I just wanted to get your take and 
since you've used the word so much, what do you think of relationships? You already have me smiling. I didn't even realize I mentioned that word, but oh, to me, that is the richness of life. If you've ever been lucky enough to have great relationships, family, friends, maybe people you work with, maybe your neighbors, it doesn't matter. If you've ever known the richness of relationships, nothing else comes close. Nothing. And, um, oh, you could, yeah, I could make you laugh. When my husband and I sold our home, you know, scaled back, closed our business and decided we're going to do something else, some people looked at us like, oh, I can't believe you did this. Well, this was long before other people thought about let's live, you know, authentically. Anyway, well, a friend of mine said, oh, my gosh, Maura, you know, people, when they reach midlife, they normally leave their spouse, they buy a Corvette and they drive off into the sunset. She said, you and your husband did the opposite. She said, you got rid of all the stuff and kept each other in the relationship. And that was the same with our daughter. And I really think about that. I think about the lives we've built. My husband and I have been together since we met in 1979 at Boston College. So imagine that. Our daughter, who I'm so happy. Now, again, it was her choice to be homeschooled. But I'm so happy that I had that time with her to build a relationship. She moved out of the house at age 16, 1,500 miles away. And you know what? She lives in New York right now. We are so close. We're such good friends. And we have these relationships that to me are the wealth of life. And I will say this. When I was very young, my probably one of my best experiences was going over to my maternal grandparents' house. My grandfather was the attorney and he had his office in the house. So my grandmother... All day, she was always cooking. She was always cleaning. But the doorbell was always ringing. We had people from the neighborhood, her, her uh, sisters, her in-laws. Everybody would come through that house. My grandfather being the attorney, this is back in the day. He had everybody come in and out of the house. And our best times were in the kitchen or in the dining room. It was food. It was cooking. It was laughter. It was conversation. To me, I would give up money to have relationships like that. It's the wealth of life. It is. And you have to be intentional and you have to put the effort up and you have to make the time to be able to do that. And a lot of people are running around so much that they kind of miss it all, unfortunately. They're busy on Instagram and Facebook. <laughs> but here's another thing, Rocky. If you look at popular media, think about the things popular media teaches us. It's, oh, why can't you be famous for your 15 minutes? Why doesn't your, Why don't you do more selfies out there? Why don't you get more likes or whatever? Why don't you get more hearts? And yet, imagine when you go outside and you have conversations with people, when you're out walking the dog, when you're laughing with somebody, having ice cream together, when you invite people over, uh, when you're cooking. Like, we don't see that promoted in our popular culture. And most people are followers of what's out there rather than intuitives that say, what really does make me happy? What does make me feel like I'm having a rich life? And if some people were out there and if more of our popular culture promoted it, then people would find it sooner. But they tend instead to look for outward clues as to what they should do and be, and more importantly, buy. Well, yes, we are marketed to beyond belief. Throughout this thing, you have said you've kind of lived an inverted life. You're doing things opposite. And I heard you say a quote, and I think it rings true. It's also inverted, and we'll dig into a little bit. But you said success follows happiness. Happiness does not follow success. Well, I was working like this in my corporate life. I explained just a little bit ago when I changed corporations, I was recruited by another one to launch a new office in management. And that was when I realized that these were people that wanted me to mistreat the employees. And I'm thinking I would only treat people the way I wanted to be. How could you even get good quality people unless you treat them well? So for about a decade in my corporate life, I was in management. And what I realized is not only did I want to attract the best people, but I wanted to promote all of their talents, and I wanted everybody to be respected like a good family would be and build good relationships. Now, here's the amazing thing. 
We had the number one office here in Florida out of, it was a national corporation I worked for, third largest in the country of its kind. We had the top office in the country for sales and for sales retention. And it wasn't because we were such wonderful people or that we were all that talented. You know what we were? We had very healthy relationships and I always promoted a feel-good atmosphere. It didn't mean we didn't set up the best expectations for ourselves and, and um, professionalism and treating other people and our clients the best we could. But we, I knew what it meant in terms of energy levels. I couldn't send our staff out to do anything if I knew there was tension or feeling of heaviness. So I just always connected a feeling of goodwill and good energy, which is obviously happiness. And I knew that it made it made success that much easier. Fast forward so many years, I'm busy writing about being happy in life. And I know that you do better when you feel happy. It's almost like giving yourself um, one of those uh, helium balloons. It lifts you up, right? When you're not happy, you feel like you're pulling a ball and chain. It was years later, I'm busy writing about happiness. I get invited to go to uh, speak at a, an international leadership conference in Southeastern Europe. They wanted me there to talk about the happiness advantage. I never heard about it. It was Harvard had Sean Aker, who for seven years was doing this study that proved empirically, I was doing it through life experiences, but the studies proved that when people are happy, they do better. When they're unhappy, they do worse and they don't have as much success. So really, I was experiencing it in real life where he was doing studies. And it has been proven that when you feel happy, your energy goes up and your success will follow. But when you are unhappy, it makes work so hard. You're not as you're not as innovative. You're not as energized. You're not as inspired. I mean, there's just so many things that follow your happiness one way and your unhappiness or feelings of being down under in an opposite way. So, yes, <laughs> happiness does help foster success. It does. And I've heard Sean speak and I've read that book and the book that he had after it. And it's quite insightful of what he learned at, at Harvard and how they behaved and what actually brought about happiness. And, and that's one of the reasons I'm kept my kids away from Ivy League schools is most of them are not happy. They're they're fulfilling someone else's dream of or a path and, and it's a shame. I think a lot of people struggle with this. Everyone is looking for the magic solution. And you have a quote that I agree with, which is everything you've been searching for is already within you. It is. You see, our world teaches us. For some reason, I must have been a very intuitive young person. But even as a preschooler, I remember thinking, watching adults and even kids think, why are they doing things to get other people's attention and approval? And I remember thinking, why don't they just go inside and ask themselves what they think? And so that's why I see my, my growing up years were always like, I was taught to concentrate on the outside, but I always had to be mindful of the inside. Our society teaches people to only to look to the outside rather than to look at what is important to them on the inside. And it goes right to the whole idea of overachieve, get into these Ivy League schools. Nothing's the matter with it if it's what you really want for the right reasons. But if you're doing it for acceptance, for maybe a replacement for who you really are on the inside, meaning you want to wear it like a cloak. You're always going to walk around with feelings of inferiority and insecurity. And I've met a lot of people like that. And that includes people with Ivy League backgrounds. So, um, it, you know, interesting. Everybody's got their own philosophy on things, but um, that is mine. I And let me just share this with you. You know, if the, everything you're looking for is hiding within your heart. As a, a very young person, I would have imagined myself traveling the world, literally traveling the world on airplanes, making friends with people in every culture, even whose languages I didn't understand. And yet my mother was agoraphobic. She usually kept me in the house away from friends. And I'm brought up to be this lawyer. I have a corporate background. I leave my corporate career, raise a child, I'm a midlife person. And then I say, you know what? I want to be a person of influence on an international level. Now, what 50-year-old female with no background in that area is going to even say such a thing on the one hand and try to do it on another, right? I have so many things in my background, Rocky, that 
I wanted to do and I wasn't even good at, but I worked at it and worked at it because they were important to me. And ultimately, those weaknesses that I had turned into strengths because I was always going back to the foundations and I would always work on things that were important to me and not only important to me um, on skill levels, but also on value levels. And, you know, I could actually say this. It's now maybe it's seven years since I started doing this, but I have spoken dozens of times overseas at universities among you know, uh, leadership conferences. I have spoken in universities here in the United States. I have the trademark title of the ambassador of happiness. I was invited to speak at the inaugural Nelson Mandela Day celebrations outside the nation's capital. And that was what they said, we're going to call you the ambassador of happiness. I have so many interesting things in my background. I did those things not because um, of schooling that I had, not because I had a, a corporate title, not because I had money behind me or people behind me saying, yes, you could do this, not because I had the right connections. I did those things that were so important to me from from childhood. That I followed values. And you know what? Those are things that were hidden in my heart as a young person. And I write about that and I speak about that and I podcast about that because I want to see the world that lives from the inside out, not from the outside Instagram version, because our world is not in the greatest place. I believe if we are true to ourselves and we follow those things that we're really interested in, we can become giants in our own right, in our own name, and we can have a certain level of confidence and well-being that doesn't easily get moved by the outside world. And that's that's really like, I would say, the, the crux of everything I'm all about. It's It's living a certain life and then giving other people some of those thoughts and tools to empower themselves to go and be their best version of self and have their best life and make a positive contribution in society. So if everything is inside ourselves, how do we find it? Well, for one thing, we have to learn to ask. Oftentimes, we never ask ourselves. We're busy asking the experts. We're busy following people. So what I always tell people is... Do you take five minutes every day before you start your day and and find out what's important to you and get that mindset and live in that mindset, especially if you're in environments where people are always bumping against you with their thoughts and their energies. But the second thing, five minutes every night and say, how did my day go? Where were some of my finest moments where I felt the best? I felt free. I felt like I was empowered. I felt inspired. I felt that I was in an expansive mode. And then where were some of those times where I felt like I I went against my better value systems, where I agreed with people maybe that I don't agree with, where I was compromising myself. These are skills that people don't even operate in because they're too busy just living on the outside. Five minutes a day could help us learn to be introspective, thoughtful, and then make intentions that are harmonious with our value systems, our interests. And then once we have our intentions correct, then we end up putting our um, our efforts in directions that will help us build a life we want to build and undo some of the elements that are maybe extraneous that really are are drawing us apart from who we really want to be, buying what we don't want to buy, and being around places we really are not interested in. Five minutes a day. So why do you think people are constantly running away from themselves instead of doing this? Why are they going the opposite direction? That's a very deep question. I'm sure I did a podcast and more on it, but I heard one woman say this one day. She said, the biggest person we're ever afraid of is looking at the person in the mirror. She said, we're afraid to to look at ourselves eyeball to eyeball because we're afraid of seeing the hypocrisy we've been living with. And by acknowledging it in our own mirrors is the most frightful thing because we're afraid that other people may see it out there. So it's a it's an unwillingness to really look at the soul of who we are. And yet, as frightening as that may be, to be a little bit introspective, it's also one of the most freeing things because that's when we realize sometimes we're wearing masks that we don't need to wear. Or maybe sometimes we're in occupations that are no longer speaking for us. It doesn't mean that we could, we're going to jump away and do something totally irresponsible. But at least knowing who we are can help us to make incremental changes. Maybe it's 10%, maybe it's 20%, or maybe it's over the course of time. And it does take time. 
We've right. heard so many stories of people who've had a life-altering event, and then they realize it, but it still takes them a few years to to start to make the changes, to figure out what it is that they want, to to take the time to ask the questions and the deeper questions of themselves, and then to start creating that path forward. And I think one of the things that holds us back is some of our internal programming, and there's probably one little word that that is the biggest of those and that is our ego and trying to overcome our ego is not an easy thing do you have any advice for us oh my goodness our ego we could say you want to have a healthy ego in so many ways our ego is not our friend because the ego is so afraid of being bruised is so afraid of being rejected and so oh my goodness the ego gets in our way from being our bigger self you know, we, I've looked at a lot of, I don't know why, this is just, it's the way I'm designed, Rocky. But I could remember one of the earliest times in life, and this is probably, maybe somebody will hear this today who's listening. I went to school with a man, he was two years ahead of me, nice guy. And he always had to wear the best clothes. And I remember him saying, you know, by the time I'm 30, I'm going to be living in the best part of Boston. And I'm going to be driving a Mercedes. And my wife was never going to work. And, and he had all of these things he wanted and all of these these excess things that all looked like they were very ego driven. By the time he was 30, he was living in the best part of Boston. Uh, he had his Mercedes. Now, this is years ago when not too many people had Mercedes. And he came to visit my husband and me down in Florida. And he all he did was complain about his job. He was an attorney up in Boston. He was miserable. He hated his job. And I said to him, well, why don't you quit? And he looked at me and said, I can't quit. I said, well, do something else. He said to me, you don't understand. I make a six-figure income. Now, this is when a six-figure income was big. Do you know, I spoke with him 20 years after that. He still was at the same job he hated because his ego couldn't take away that whole idea of, I just want to do what I want to do. His father had um, owned a gas station and his in his mind he had to be better than his father he had to be the so-called white collar guy he had to be the one that you know was uh, living this completely different life it was his ego that was getting in his way of a full life of a happy life and of a free life because it was all the outer wear but underneath it he was so unhappy and if I would say further than unhappy it was as if he was incarcerated so that's a good example of how the ego can work against us when we are dealing with fears of how others may view us or maybe worse how we might view ourselves if we were willing to maybe step away from something or maybe step into something where we wouldn't always be guaranteed of success or we would have to stumble for a while to get where we wanted to go and ego let me tell you you could be any age any background and that ego could really be a tough thing to overcome it is it takes a lot of time i know it took me quite a while to overcome my ego and there's probably days that it still rears its ugly head from time to time same here you mentioned something which is we get into that comfort zone and we get stuck in we feel like we have to be a certain person and we cannot change. Or if we change, we're not going to be happy because we're afraid of giving up all of all of those comforts, the nice car, the six figure salary and everything that goes along with it. And yet we need to exit the comfort zone. We need to try new things and, and test out the ideas that we decide might be better for us than the ones we started following. Any advice on how to get out of our comfort zone? From one who's lived through so much of her own life lessons? Yes, I do have some advice. And these comfort zones, it's not just of giving up stuff. Oftentimes, Rocky, it's the way in which we view ourselves, meaning our identity, and it's the friends we keep, and the so-called comfort level that we live inside of that forms our sense of where we know the rules and who knows us and how they know us. I, I'll share this. It has nothing to do with money, but it has to do with comfort zones, egos, and stepping out into our bigger self. When I was very young, I always wanted to learn how to dance. And I, from the first time I ever saw American Dance Stand, Dance Stand, where I saw teenagers dancing, to me, that was like utter joy. Well, instead, I grew up taking piano and art lessons and calligraphy lessons. No um, amount of, um, 
what do they call it, coordination ever involved, right? Well, our daughter was growing up and she loved dance, so I took her to all kinds of dance classes. When she was enrolled in college, she called me one day and she said, Mom, they're giving, uh, they're, they're offering intro to jazz here at the college. And I said, really? I said, you're going to enroll in it? And she said, Mom, why would I do that? I've had seven years of dance. She said, you're going to do it. Now, Rocky, this is what she said to me, Mom, I always knew, I, you've always wanted to dance. And you've said that to me for years. She said, this is a college class. You're not going to see five-year-olds and tutu there's tutus there. Go and do it. Now, Rocky, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm too old. I don't have any coordination. I'm going to look like an idiot. But I remember thinking, I don't want to be a bad example for my daughter. I want to be a positive role model, someone whose daughter could say, you know, you could keep growing at any age. I enrolled in classes. And Rocky, I wasn't just bad. I was so bad people were laughing at me. I ended up failing two of the classes. I almost destroyed an onstage performance. I used to leave those classes some nights laughing. Other nights, my eyes were stinging because I wanted to cry. I thought, I can't believe I'm this, this stupid that I literally couldn't get what was going on in that classroom. I was so afraid, and I want to tell you why. Because I was always told I was uncoordinated, because I thought I was too old, because I was really good with words, I could describe anything to you. I knew my strengths, but I didn't know how to move my body. Rocky, I worked so hard in that in that class, and I never gave up. And I didn't I didn't destroy the onstage performance. But I'll tell you what, that whole process ended up getting me out of my own comfort zone. I had to get rid of so much mental baggage. I had to make new connections in my in my mind and my body. I had to test myself beyond the old identity, which said, Laura, she's smart. She was a good corporate manager. She was a good mom. Um, and however I was seen in my old life, and it had to stretch me beyond bounds. But I'll tell you, when I got finished with that extraordinary couple of year experience, I came out of it with so much more confidence, so much more joy, so much more happiness, so much more resiliency, so much more of a sense of humor about myself and so much more compassion for other people that have had tough times doing things. But even more than that, that experience helped me launch my Art of Happiness book series. And so that whole thing about getting out of your comfort zone and doing really what you wanted to do in life, even if it has a different picture today than maybe it had years ago, uh, helps us grow. And I'll tell you this, from that process, I had friends of mine that never went to see me, uh, dropped me as friends. And that's one of the big things that happen when you step out of your comfort zone. You get some people that only know you one way. They don't want to know you another way. But in the process of even trying to stay in a comfort zone with friends that you think will not like you because you want to be your bigger self, that may be, may be one of the risks to the ego, but it also opens you up maybe to new friends, maybe to new relationships, and maybe to more expansive places. I know you ask one question, I'll give you lots of words. I'm really good with words, but I hope that I've made the point. In fact, Rocky, for any of your listeners today who have something in their own life that they always wanted to do and they want a little bit of encouragement and inspiration, I'd love to share with them a free copy of my book, um, Comfort Zones. If they want to write to me, Maura, M-A-U-R-A, at my website, mauraforyou.com, and just in the headline, write down your show, Richer Soul uh, Podcast, and I will send them a free copy of the book, Exiting the Comfort Zone. So Maura at mauraforyou.com. And if you have a place in your show notes that you could give them my email address um, or any place to write that down, I'd be happy to do because it's Maura. M A U R A at Mora, the number four, the letter U dot com. And we'll put that in the show notes so people can Good. just click and find it very easily. And thank you for sharing that. And I think this is the one thing when you get out of your comfort zone in one area and you start to achieve success. And again, as it said, you said it didn't happen overnight. It wasn't one class. It took time and time again. You get a certain amount of confidence. As you grow, it is true, you're going to change your friends because you're going to want to be around people who also grow. And we are the average of the five people we're around. And when we start to become different, then we stop fitting in with people who don't want to grow or who don't want to extend themselves and be happy. And so that is kind of one of the 
the byproducts that people struggle with of success in yes. in life is that sometimes you need to change your friends and it's a difficult struggle, but it's not you. They're going to walk away from you. So you don't even have to worry, right? They walked away from yes, you. That's you didn't what have it was. to walk away from them. Right. Exactly. That was it. It was, I never walked away from them, but it was just that I was making them uncomfortable as I was expanding myself. And I made plenty of new friends, but that's the other thing. And too, that also affects the ego because we know ourselves based on our friends, based on our comfort zone, isn't just our job and our title or our income, but it is our friendships. It's the way in which we know the rules. We know how we're viewed, but stepping out, it's sort of like uncharted territory, but I would love to see everybody step out of their comfort zones because I think we'd see such incredible giftings, such variety, such inspiration, so much more happiness and harmony in this world than we're seeing right now. And I think a lot of people end up exerting a lot of negative energy because they're not happy because they're not being who they want to be. And that's absolutely true. And in the two episodes prior to this, we actually talk about the science behind how our brain wants to keep us safe, but not happy. It wants us to be safe and not successful. And what you're doing is kind of showing how this is the outcome of overcoming your brain and overcoming what it's trying to do and overcoming those things that are going on and stepping up and out and where it leads to in life. And so that's awesome. I agree with everything you said. I do, Rocky. I think we both must have, I don't know, taken lessons from the same book of life. <laughs> so we have covered a lot of different areas. Is there an area that we should have covered that I may have missed today? I don't think so, but I would like to add a little addendum on to what you were just saying. When we begin the process of going through our lives and finding out what we really want to do, who we really want to be, what's really of interest to us so that we do live the life that's important to us, we do have to make changes. And each one of those changes challenges our ego. And many of them are not all that easy. And they don't happen overnight. And the process itself can be challenging. But the important thing I'd love to just say as the addendum is that the long-term effects are worth the journey to get there. And it is a journey. And yeah. it takes time. And your first few steps are horrible, just like the first <laughs> few times in the dance class. But over time, you improve. And over time, it grows. And you become amazed. And then one day, you literally turn a curve. It's kind of like the compound interest curve and you're soaring and life is amazing. And you just look around, you go, wow. But if you don't keep taking the steps and you don't keep taking the little actions and you don't keep doing it, it's not going to happen. And that's kind of the biggest thing I've learned in all of these interviews that I've had is that most people just don't take that first step and the second step and the third step. It's not that they can't go from 80 to 100. It's that they can't go from zero to 10. And the people who get to 10 get to 100. But you just got to get up and go. Rocky, you are right. And let me just bring this full circle. You had come up with one of my quotes. And I think I have this in several of my books. I have an e-course as well. Everything you are ever looking for is hidden within your heart. That's where we go to say, what's important to me? What are my values? What do I like? What do I want to become? When we live from the inside, it requires us to think a certain way, but then to follow through with that. And it's in the doing of it repeatedly that we literally become that finer self. We become the gem we've been looking for. I write, I speak in different places. There are many things I do. I didn't get there overnight because I just decided I want to be that. I started at square one. And in many cases, I wasn't all that adept, but I learned from practice. But over the course of time, that practice that is within us ends up becoming the outside of us and the fullness of us. And you talk about a wealth, a wealth of being when you know you have made yourself into the person you are. By exercising your talents, by exercising your interests, by being consistent in things that are important to you, whether in pursuits or skills or whatever it may be, you can literally walk anywhere in life 
and people see you as a person of wealth because the wealth is you. It's not the things you're wearing. It's not the title you got from some corporation or the degree that you picked up from a university, things that you have to advertise. You literally carry it in your very being. And that's why I mentioned that thing. Everything you've always been looking for is hidden in your heart, but very few people are willing to go there and to start pulling those things out. So as we wrap up today, I always like to have an action step. What is something that our audience can do this week from an action standpoint to get closer to having the life they choose to want and desire? This is something I mentioned to everyone, and it's a good way to finish because I hope that they would listen and do this later on today or whenever they're quiet. Close your eyes. Put your hand over your heart as if you were going to say the Pledge of Allegiance. You know where that is? The reason why is that it moves your attention away from your intellect and ego and more to your soul or let's say your heart. And with your eyes closed, take a few breaths and just survey. Look for a time in your life before the world told you what you could or couldn't be, especially if you were younger, but it doesn't matter. And as soon as you see or remember a time that brings a smile to your face, stop right there because That's a moment that speaks about who you are and what your happiness is. It's from your soul, not from your intellect and not from society and not from programming. If you could connect with some of those things and consider them threads and start following the threads of those thoughts, you will literally be living your life from the inside out. You'll be building a new life. You'll be building a better life, a better identity. Your clarity will be there. Your interest will be there. And I want to tell you, my best times were looking up at airplanes, thinking about a time when I could travel the world, make new friends, and more than that, talk about, write and talk about ideas that people would discuss. And I remember loving John F. Kennedy back then. That's how old I am. And what do I do today? I travel the world. I write about leadership. I speak about leadership. And I am making friends everywhere I go. Now, it doesn't look like it did when I was age four. But all I did was follow those little threads that made me happy as a young child. And I wove them over the course of time and practice into something that was reflective of who I am. Every single listener today can find their own life threads. And it could be doing anything next door or around the world. Big, little, doesn't matter. It's just that you be who you want to be and make your life richer from the inside out. That is a wonderful action step. We'll make sure that that is in the show notes as well. So if people would like to connect with you, learn more about what you do, listen to your podcast, find your books, where do they find all of this? I did mention my books. They could write to me more at More For You. But the easy thing, go to my website. It's Maura, my name, M-A-U-R-A, number four, letter U dot com. And they could subscribe to my blogs or they could just write to me on there about the book. But since you have a listening audience, Rocky, I would love to have them look for me. It's Maura Sweeney, Living Happy Inside Out podcast. So Maura Sweeney, Living Happy Inside Out. And these are 10 minute long podcasts and it will give them all kinds of action steps about how to live an authentic, happy, and I would say heart healthy life from the inside out. And thank you for sharing that. And I encourage people to check it out. And this has been the wonderful conversation that I expected to have. I thank you so much for joining us today. Rocky, thank you. I love this kind of conversation. So thanks so much for having me on. Happiness is found inside yourself. More as action step of spending time in your heart and looking for your happiness can be part of a daily meditation process. As we've learned, the answer is within us. The science shows our thoughts create our lives. What thoughts are you allowing to dictate your life? Are they abundant or are they fear-based? It's natural for our brain to keep us in fear. This sounds so easy to do, and yet it's hard. It takes a lifetime to let go of others' expectations and society's rules. It's a process. Just like building wealth in the compound curve. You take a step. You win, you lose, you learn. Just showing up and know the direction you are going is important. That's the core. What's your purpose? What do you want? If you don't know, how are you going to build the life of your dreams? In the past three episodes, we've talked about going into your heart. Back in episode 75, we met Jake Eagle, and I chatted about living a thrilling life. 
I just completed his live course on living a thrilling life and moving from safety conscious to heart conscious. It's a slow process, and I just keep showing up and working on it. If you're interested, go back and check out that episode or check out his website to see about the course yourself. If you're still listening, you must have liked this episode. So please share it with a few friends. I'd appreciate that. What's preventing you from moving forward? And who are you putting on your team to help build the life you deserve? Taking no action creates a far worse outcome in life than trying something and failing. Can I help you achieve your goals? Just email me and we can start with a short chat to see if we're a good fit. For many people, one session allows them to take a giant leap forward. You can reach me at rocky at richersoul.com. I'd love to hear how you're doing and how the information I've shared has helped you. Thanks for listening. Have an abundant week.